we'd like to invite our special guest, the panel, to come up. I mean, is going to introduce them to you. Uh, first, we have Sharon Matt Atkins, is a managing curator of exhibitions at the Brooklyn Museum, where she has coordinated numerous special exhibitions since 2009. Of special note, she co-organized GOG, a community curated open studio project in 2012 with Shelley Bernstein, and currently has organized two important exhibitions that have opened this month at the museum, including the Brooklyn presentation of I Wait Wait, According to what? And of course, Sharon organized Swoon to merge motherlands. Keith Schweitzer is the co-founder and director of many projects, murals around New York, and the co-founder and director of the Lodge Gallery in Manhattan. He is also the director of Public Art for Fourth Art Block, the non-profit leadership organization for Manhattan's officially designated cultural district in the East Village. Keith was also a founding member of No Longer Empty, serving as director of exhibitions and curator from 2009 to 2011. Catherine Lorimer, aka Luna Park, is a Brooklyn-based graffiti and street art enthusiast, photographer, curator, and librarian. As co-founder and regular contributor to the Street Spot blog, she is passionate about urban art and her photographs have appeared in leading street art books and magazines and have been in New York, exhibited in New York, LA, and Chicago. An occasional lecturer, she has recently presented her observations on street art at the New York Public Library and the Long Island University. Soon, Caledonia Curry, is a street artist living in Brooklyn for the last 17 years since coming to study at the Grand Institute. <laughs> since 1999, her wit of linoleum and woodcuts in the streets in the industrial sections of Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx have made her work a favorite and an inspiration to fans and to other street artists. Her art is in the collections of the Brooklyn Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Tate Modern, among others. And of course, she's currently at the Brooklyn Museum with Sue, to merge more events. <laughs> yeah! Please welcome my So I um, was really admired the work that they did, 
and a friend of mine, Mike Snell, who's done a lot of sort of interesting projects over the years and had a gallery, um, sort of we like together dreamed up this idea of going there to actually work at their safe house, to create a workshop with the girls that would be kind of a therapeutic experience, and then also to create a piece from that that they would be able to use to further their work. So at the time that we went there, they were just um, actually in a major lawsuit against uh, they were suing the, the Kenyan police to uphold the, the constitution of Kenya. They were trying to get them just to enforce the laws that were already on the books. Exactly, because Kenya actually has one of the most developed constitutions like around rape laws, they just don't enforce them. And in fact, like girls and women were were going to the police to report their, their rape cases and actually like sometimes being raped by the police as a as a, a mode of like enforced silencing. And so, you know, she was like, I started this safe house, I started this clinic, I started this hospital, but I'm tired of mopping the floor while the faucet is still running was the phrase that she used. Uh, she was like, I want to take this right yeah. to the source. Yeah. Um, and so she started working with the government and then I just sort of created this piece as a way to control you also went there and yeah. worked with, uh, with the kids. a number of the kids to yeah. create art projects. I exactly. remember uh, seeing the photographs of that. Yeah, so we spent about a week in the compound with the girls, and we did this whole, like, these drawings, you know, we sort of talked about different things about home and safety and strength and all different kinds of words and, and thoughts and associations, and then we created a performance, and they performed it for the families. Right. And, and I photographed all the notebooks before I went home, and then these drawings were oh, drawings that came okay. out of the notebooks. And, and did they then see the final yeah. work? And what was their what was their response? I mean, they were excited and they really wanted us to come back. Sadly, I haven't been back yet. Okay. But, um, but, but yeah, and actually, one of the one of the girls was um, a girl. Usually, the girls are there for for a short period of time. But one of the girls that I took a lot of the drawings from ended up being adopted by uh, one of the main lawyers, and she lives in Canada now. So I was able to see her uh, about six months. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, it was really great. So nice. It was quite sentimental, and she remembered me from Kenya, and it just was really incredible. It's great that you made that connection. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. anyone interested, look up the equality effect. They're totally, totally yeah. phenomenal. Equality effect. And Luna, um, you've been documenting graffiti and street art for more than a decade? Uh, almost, almost, almost 10 years at this point. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your experience finding one of the early pieces on the street? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I can actually remember the very first piece of Callie's um, that I saw of her. Um, the very simple reason that it was my introduction to street art um, was about 2005. Um, not this piece, not, not but another one. one. I, was I, 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 I don't <laughs> actually have a good photo of the first piece because the camera I had on at the time was like the first point of shoot I bought that was so low red. Well, I mean, that uh, <laughs> I think I could probably. Were you really at that point? Were you thinking about? No, it? at no. that point I had no idea that I might ten years later be interested in having a better copy of the picture. Mm. Um, so I was walking down Weiss Avenue, um, sort of near where the Weiss Hotel is today in Williamsburg, and all of a sudden this female face popped out at me um, from a door and. Um, because I hadn't really given street art or graffiti any thought up until this point, I really had no way of putting this into any kind of context. So it, it literally stopped me in my tracks when I was looking at this face, and it was a girl wearing a, a stripy shirt, and I think it was printed on some kind of a Asian newspaper. Um, it was already sort of half decayed, and um, it really marked sort of a, a paradigm shift for me because all of a sudden it was like the wool had been pulled from in front of my eyes and I started seeing street art and graffiti everywhere just looking down the street while there's something there, there's a stencil across the street and for for a place, this a place that you had that you were walking around every day. Yeah, I mean yeah. once you're sensitized, I mean those of us who, who pay attention to tags and stickers and wheat paste and throwies and, uh, you know, art, know that once you become sensitized to yeah. that, you can't really unsee it anymore. No, it's like once that veil has been pierced, street art is everywhere, and everything is possible street art. <laughs> Just because you've seen it on the street, it might be an installation. So I was actually really pleased to be invited to participate this evening. Uh, in, in a way, I feel like I've come
come full circle and to be able to sit here uh, with the woman who inspired me to take this journey uh, is, a, is, a, is a great opportunity. Um, so this, actually the other, the last piece, the mermaid piece, um, I shot, I think about a year after that, in 2006, and I remember being on my way to work and being late and on the bus and a flash of something white caught the corner of my eye and I hopped off the bus, even though it wasn't, down, it wasn't my stop, and ran down and ran down the street and was confronted with this beautiful mermaid piece, which um, remains one of my favorite street art pieces to this day, uh, not only because of the content of the piece, but because of the, the memory of, of the just the, the joy and excitement of the discovery. I mean, this was really at the beginning of when I started um, looking for street art, and these early pieces really inspired me in a way that, um, that you know, led me to where we are today. Can you talk about this piece? Um, this is a wall on Rivington Street on the Lower East Side that uh, Callie had maintained for a couple years, um, from 2003 to about 2007, I think, and had painted uh, a couple times. Um, as someone who was just getting into the into the scene at this point, this was a really great place to kind of watch her craft evolve from um, early stencil pieces to increasingly elaborate uh, line of cuts and portraits of friends, and then sort of finally the introduction of, of color to, to her work. And I've really come to realize that in, in all the years I've been doing this, it's a, it's a scene that sees a lot of fluctuations, but um, Swoon's work has been a, a remarkable consistent in all those years. Now Keith, um, you've been very tied to the Lower East Side um, community and organizing murals, um, creating opportunities, really, creating opportunities for street artists. Um, and I know you did some work with um, another one of the very few female um, street artists named Kate. Um, on project, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how the community responded to this work, and just tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is a, a this art installation is called Truth Implies the Good, and um, it's uh, three portraits, two of which are portraits of her uh, close friends, and one is a self-portrait. Um, and it's part of a public art program that I direct in the cultural district. Um, through its uh, nonprofit leadership organization, Fort Arts Club. And we program areas um, uh, north of the house and along Bowery, so East 3rd Street, East 2nd Street, East 3rd Street, and so on. Uh, this is on East 3rd Street, and this block in particular within the neighborhood is uh, somewhat neglected uh, in the sense, meaning it's dimly lit at night. Uh, right directly across from this wall is a men's homeless shelter and a men's health services center. Um, and this particular location was um, used to be a schoolhouse that had a fire long ago, and it was shuttered. Uh, it's now the Mama Theater. Uh, their entrance is on 4th Street. So it really was this you know, beautiful art, like triple archway. Um, and uh, when I invited uh, Kate to, uh, to participate in the program, uh, we immediately responded to the beauty of these, I mean, even the decay over time uh, had its own inherent beauty. Uh, and we talked about things like stained glass or things that actually belong in this thing that hadn't been seen or really looked at, it's been hiding in the site this entire time. So she went back to the studio and uh, she created uh, and absorbed all of that and uh, made these in studio on paper uh, over the course of, I believe, uh, a month and a half. And then we came back out and we repasted them onto the wall. And um, uh, I expected. Uh, that we, this would take a, a lot of maintenance, that there'd be a lot of um, people trying to add to this mural. Uh, and, uh, Collaborate. So yeah, there's lots of that. It's, it's flanked by a lot of, um, there is a lot of graffiti, uh, it's an active graffiti block. Uh, but it was pristine. Uh, no, one, no one had touched it. Uh, no one, um, uh, I, I, I was, there was like a month went by, nothing. Uh, another month went by and it was just perfectly immaculate. Uh, and it wasn't until about maybe the third month when I noticed one little yellow spray painted graffiti tag, and 
I went up to Fort Dart's Block's office and I got a little pink bucket and roller and I started to come back down and um, and these two guys uh, stopped me and um, they asked me what I was doing and uh, this is getting to the effect of um, what, what this mural had on the community. Yeah. They, they said, I think in the next slide there's one. Yes. Uh, you'll see the two guys that stopped me. And <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm walking with this, this paint bucket uh, to, to paint over the yellow tag, and they, they said, what, you know, what, are, what are you doing? You know, uh, and I told them what I was going to do. And they said, we've been protecting, this is, you know, this is our mural, we're protecting it. And, um, and they, they took it from me and they, they wanted to do it themselves. And at that moment I realized that uh, this artwork had become part of the fabric of that block and had become part of that community on that block. Um, um, and they appreciated it, and that is one of the most powerful things we can do with this type of art, uh, you know, out goes in the street, is uh, connection. the connection made. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really, really well, I think it becomes part of the discourse on the street with the neighbors. And like you said, they take this such a great sense of ownership over the piece that they're ready to push you aside and say, no, we got this. Yeah, they want me to know what I would do. We'll fix this, you know. <laughs> What are you doing? Uh, I love that. I love the way that when uh, I walk through the street, I see a piece again and again that I've seen. I've uh, become attracted and become uh, like I have a personal relationship with the piece. And I'm a little sad when it's gone. Well, the, the sense of immediacy. And one of the things that you talked about is this idea of family yes. um, and autobiography and the way that that comes in. And it creates a connection um, to people who are, who are encountering the work. Um, and I think, Kelly, that's one of the things with your um, installation upstairs, Submerged Motherlands, um, one of the works that you incorporated into that is a relatively new, new work um, that you created um, that um, is a portrait of your mother um, in various stages um, of her life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things we see it here. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about that and about including that um, in this installation as well. Yeah, um, so I, this installation was something I've been thinking about for over a year, for kind of a while we've been planning it, and I've been thinking a lot about kind of climate change and the flooding of our homes and sort of loss of motherland in that way, and then during that time, my mom became sick with cancer and died, and I went through the process of mourning with her, and, and uh, and, and, and started to think about this installation, this kind of a multi-layered installation of thinking about sort of the loss of your own mother and that sort of initial motherland as well. And, you know, my own mother, she was this totally kind of sweetest, most cherubic, wonderful person who also struggled terribly with drug addiction for her entire life. Um, she was addicted to heroin when I was born and she remained addicted to all different substances just throughout her life. And, um, that was something that I had really been, has, was quite formative in my life in the last couple of years. I had been working really hard to find a, a process of forgiveness with her. And, um, and then when she was, was diagnosed with cancer, I really kind of realized that all the work that I had been doing to try to put her addiction into perspective was, was kind of all coming to this place. And um, I gave a talk about it on uh, The Feast on Good, it's called, and I also wrote a piece for CNN, so if anybody wants to like learn more about um, this process or these for the doctor that um, that I talk about you can look there but there's this doctor named Gabo Monte and he really introduced to me the concept that people who are struggling with addictions of that magnitude where you really lose control of your own life that that is not something that comes out of a hedonism but that's something that comes out of a deep deep pain that you wouldn't ever choose that and you wouldn't you know, it's not that this woman was like, I love shooting smack more than I love taking care of my baby. Right. And you just don't, you just don't choose that. And I think that I, I, I sort of spent a lot of my life being like, fuck you, why can't you get your shit together, you know? And then in the last sort of years of, of our, our life together, I came to kind of really shift perspective and to actually be able to have conversations with her about that and to really kind of make a deep connection and a deep forgiveness um, with her before she died. And so. If you see the, this, this sculpture right here, kind of what's going on in there is that the top portrait is a friend of mine who's just this most incredible mother. 
And I think that in a way, I was kind of trying to give a mother to my own mother, to sort of mother all of us, you know? She's yes. this kind of very, yes. right? She's yeah, like this yeah. kind of universal mother. Did yeah, anyone yeah. meet her? She was at the opening. I did not. With her baby, and she was Sweet. crying. <laughs> I didn't really warn her that I was going to make a gigantic portrait of her. <laughs> so she just came. But, um, and then there's also, you kind of see some sort of demon figures, and those are kind of, all of the drawings uh, that I made of my mother in her life process, including the demonic figures and the drawings of my friend, were all pieces, you know, sometimes I kind of work on a different schedule. I'll say, okay, I'll make that next week or I'll make that next month. But when my mother came in, I just immediately had to shift into making that work while I was caring for her and trying to process that experience. And so that was something that, you know, originally this show was just going to be the tree of the boats. And then this thing happened to me, and, and so the, the narrative of it really shifted and deepened into containing the sort of personal history of my mom and her life and of our kind of whole process together and of trying to really understand her and understand, understand, you know. I think it's remarkable that you bring these personal stories <laughs> yeah. and share them with others. And, uh, and I also think it's interesting when I see something on the street that I don't understand mm -hmm. and then to later find out what the backstory right. of it was. We've been lucky to have that experience a number of times. And your work can be so powerful, particularly when I find out that the story is the other sometimes. I make up the story myself. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems yeah. just as meaningful. Right. Yes. And I think one of the things that in, in, in the work that you've shown tonight um, by a number of artists, I think you you get that sense um, that, that these are these are not anonymous people. Mm -hmm. that, that they mean something to the person who's created them. Um, and I think that that's one of the things, Luna, you worked with um, the Art C215 um, and went around documenting um, and shooting his work. Um, and that that work comes up for a very personal um, practice as well, and very much about that family connection. Yeah, um, it comes with his daughter. From a place of passion, really. Right. Right. And I think all of these works that speak to us speak to us because of the passion that comes through. Um, so I first became aware of the work of the French artist C215 in 2007, I think. Um, a friend of his had come to New York and he pasted a uh, work of his on paper on a wall in Tribeca, uh, which I randomly found and photographed and um, uploaded to Flickr. And um, I guess at this point I should mention Flickr in the early two, mid 2000s was a real important resource um, and kind of hub for not just the street art community, but um, it was where I really had my first education in street art. It was where um, I really was able to make personal connections with uh, a lot of artists. And so, um, and having uploaded this piece, uh, C215 kind of came out of the woodwork and identified himself. And through that, um, started a conversation um, we sort of corresponded, and then we actually met in person the first time about a year later in 2008, where he literally showed up on my doorstep. Um, he had come to New York, and um, I guess the place where he was supposed to stay fell through. And was he doing that show at Ad Hoc? No, no, no. This was, this was, this was before that. This was, was like his, that. his first, his first trip before he was really well known, and. Um, because he didn't really know anybody else, he sent me an email and said, hey, you know, can I crash at your place? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I was living with my brother at the time, so I thought, like, okay, you know what, I, you know, I'm going to like gamble and take a risk and put this slightly disheveled paint cover Frenchman up for the night. Fortunately, he really hit it off and uh, he ended up spending the rest of the week with us. And um, um, in Chris, I found a highly intelligent, um, very philosophical, um, very motivated and passionate artist. And um, the one thing that was really clear from the beginning was that he was madly in love with his then five-year-old daughter, Nina. Um, and at the time, uh, he was separated from her mother, and uh, you know, this situation clearly troubled him very much. And um, I think he was afraid that she would interpret this absence in her life uh, to mean that you know she no, he, he no longer cared for her. And so he started uh, 
cutting and painting her portraits. And in the beginning, um, just putting them up uh, in the town where she lived and leaving them in places where you know she might find them on the way to school and be surprised. And um, I think as the home situation grew more and more unacceptable, um, he decided to travel. So this was about the time um, I met him he was on the beginning of what would be sort of a whirlwind, multi-year, multi-city uh, campaign to, to paint as many cities as possible. Um, and even though he arrived with a, with a stencil portfolio that was uh, literally inches thick, he continued to produce uh, new pieces literally around the clock. I mean, my kitchen floor was littered with bits of paper uh, after he left. And um, he put up an enormous number of illegal stencil pieces in, in Brooklyn. Um, but the, the sort of the one thing was it would always Nina, Nina, Nina. And uh, Nina was, was captured in all her many moods um, in that last piece. She's looking, um, the one that was before, she's looking, you know, a little forlorn and it, it, it's next to a mail slot on the door. So I always think, you know, she's waiting for a, a letter that I make. <laughs> um, but, uh, this other picture uh, was a more recent um, uh, portrait of her now, a sort of young preteen, and um, I'm happy to say that the home situation has improved, and she now lives with him part of the year. And how many um, do you think he did? You know, I, 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 I asked him, and I, I mean, I'm thinking probably hundreds. I feel like I've seen at least um, nine or ten images I mean, of his daughter, and, and it's really wonderful girl. because you can really see how. It, you know, this process of obsessively portraying his daughter and then other people, yes. how, how his craft has really developed. And you can see uh, in that last piece where he's in a, in a sort of much happier, looser, colorful place. Um, yes. And that's, um, you know, clear based on the work. We have to move a little quickly. Can you tell us briefly about uh, some of the images that he's done? Yeah, I mean, uh, his other great passion, other than uh, one of his great passions, other than his daughter, he's also very much interested in issues of social justice. And so uh, he's uh, gone out of his way to uh, portrait um, homeless and marginalized and uh, really to kind of draw attention to people that uh, might otherwise be overlooked. Um, and this was a, a homeless person um, on the streets of Berlin. Now, um, Keith, um, one question before we um, turn it over to a couple of our audience questions. Um, a couple of years ago, you were able to secure a wall um, for the Israeli artist No Hope. Um, and here, here we see that. Um, and this here, in part, um, the story about a local resident. Um, and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, th this, um, this piece actually is another part of the uh, Fourth Arts Block Public Art Program. It's on East Second Street in the block south of the South Cape's Bureau. Um, and uh, it, No Hope's, uh, this, it, it's deceivingly simple, and that's the power of uh, No Hope's work. It's very poetic and minimalist, but um, we're first seeing this big swap of blue, and then we're seeing this little cartoon character in the right hand side, and this hovering flag. And the cartoon character is, is, is a recurring and central character in this non linear narrative that No Hope. Uh, has been uh, putting out there throughout the years. And uh, the thing you'll notice his heart is not where it should be. It's on his sleeve, and his character is literally wearing his heart on his sleeve. He's very vulnerable and exposed. And in this case, he's being threatened by this, this, this oncoming wave of uh, blues, so of this blue um, field. And, um, and it's important to realize, uh, you can see the flag a little bit too. There's, there's a flag image on, on the left hand side. And, um, I, you know, in conversations with Novo while he was here before we did chose this composition, um, I mean, the flag is a very powerful, it could represent uh, a nation or patriotism or uh, a heritage, but, um, uh, you know, we, we've all been talking about this, um, and we're all feeling this uh, process, this wave of development and gentrification and increased cost of living and, um, and feeling like, like where we live is no longer our home. And a flag is where an advancing force will lay claim to a land that they now have, uh, you know, 
conquer an enemy. It becomes theirs. So um, it, it's a powerful metaphor in the Tension, but he did it also with a second fold where he like, made it a surrender flag. So mm -hmm. now you have Nobuo's no oh, yeah. character bearing the full brunt of this enormous wave of uh, Feldman and gentrification and, and, um, and he's holding on barely, but teasing him on the far end is this flag that, um, you know, we all know the white flag is, you know, I give up. He tries to reach for it in any way, shape, or form. This thing's just going to collapse and, 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 uh, and kill his character. And, um, with, with, and no host of characters are typically put in these types of situations where they're responding to uh, these, these, these human conditions that we can all relate to that, uh, that together make up, you know, and can address uh, more complex issues. But through the use of an illustrated character, it disarms us in a way that we can explore and talk about it. Um, but uh, the, the blue field that you see there, we knew that it would invite um, that type of contribution and participation. And there was. And, there yeah. Was. And, and, and <laughs> Collaboration. We wanted it. Uh, we, we, you know, we, did, uh, we, we knew it was going to happen. It's on Second uh, East Second Street, uh, just east of Bowery, and um, we knew that it would happen. Uh, and that the conversation with No Hope was that it would become part of the piece. Like, would it be in support, or does it become part of erasing the blue part and it becomes more of a community bulletin board in a sense, or does it become more of a burden and weight that has to be carried? You know, is it going to get a legal advertising platform? What's going to happen to this blue field? Um, but I never imagined that um, that was, uh, there was a, a UK-based artist named Flem, and he had never been to New York, and he sent me an email saying, "Hey, I'm in New York, and I, uh, you know, I love No Hope. Uh, he's a big inspiration to me, and I'd like to collaborate uh, with No Hope's piece, with my character." So I think there's a slide of uh, what happened. There. So, so, so you'll start to see some of that, um, the, the other background uh, additives to the walls, but. Uh, Flum came in, and in one afternoon, uh, he created a character. You can see how he is inspired by No Hope. It's, uh, you know, Flem's a great artist in his own way. But his character, No Hope's now in Tel Aviv. Flem is visiting from the UK, and here their characters are meeting for the first time, even though the artists have never met. And Flem's character, what he's doing is pulling and helping assist No Hope's character uh, defeat this awning coming away from the blue. So we have, um, I think, time for, to, for a couple, a few questions. I'm looking for Elizabeth to give me my, to give me my cue. Um, but maybe we'll start here um, with this question that I think any number of you can um, answer. Um, with the increasing gentrification of Brooklyn, what impact do you think this will have on street art? Well, um, what's happening in the city is, uh, is the city is uh, becoming increasingly sanitized. Um, it is more difficult for street artists to go and put uh, street art that is illegal. But somehow they managed to do it. So I have the utmost hope that they could still find time to go and put these pieces out. Because yes. we've seen them. I mean, there's a lot of murals that are commissioned, but at the same time, we see a lot of difficult street artists in the city, and I think that it's not there. No, it's certainly not there. Street art is going to exist wherever there are people. And uh, yeah, there's an increase in gentrification and development, but there are a lot of uh, run-down, neglected, uh, ex-industrial sectors, and that's usually the first place, the first target. Yeah, I mean, I always see street art in the neighborhood as kind of an indicator of, um, I don't want to call it the health of the neighborhood, but, but uh, its willingness to, to tolerate yeah. uh, unauthorized additions. And, you know, the more things get whitewashed, the more giant, anonymous glass boxes get put up, the more street art disappears, so yes. it's kind of a fine line of watching as neighborhoods get, you know, developed, made over, uh, that in many cases, you know, street art or public art at all isn't necessarily part of that makeover. Right. And that being said, Manhattan is almost empty of street art at this point. Well, that, that relates to another question, is can street art itself be gentrified? 
and the great washes of color that Callie went to town, the fire extinguisher, in that space in a way that when we started talking to people in the museum, like, she's going to do what? <laughs> she's going to do what? I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 it'll be fine, it'll be fine, I'll put plastic down, it'll all be fine. Yeah. <laughs> and then as people are coming in and there are puddles of water all over the floor, um, seeping in a little bit into museum offices, a little bit. <laughs> But yeah, like you, so, you, so you maintained that sense of pushing the pushing the boundaries and such. <laughs> and Kelly actually that said that you gave her a lot of leeway. She so pushed yeah. further than she thought you would go sometimes. There's a story that I'm not even going to tell now. I'll tell you later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for these conversations. <laughs> With, with that, um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.